for Reaper Metal Productions, this is Into the Darkness, with no episode complete without Thomas by my side, because this week's guest he took with uh, him into the grave, and that's because we've got Jorgen Sandstrom, and it's, we're really he- happy to have you on the show, man. Are you ready to go into the darkness with us and get extremely down and nerdy? And So I'm doing, going right to, I think, the actual beginning, and that is the Corpse demo from 1986. Where All I right. think you debuted your uh, talents as guitar and vocals and, and bass, and that pretty much kicked it off your career, right? Where you're essentially now like you've done so many projects where you're not just one uh, talent; you've done you know numerous uh, instrumentations. So is Corpse really the beginning of it all, or? Uh, not really. We had bands before that too. So we started. We started. I think on Corpse there's uh, Jens, Ola, and uh, another guy, right? Jorgen. His name was also Jorgen and playing bass. Uh, but before that, we had we started in '83 playing together, or '84 maybe. So two years, two years prior to that, we already started, uh, you know, jamming metal songs together. Just a bunch. We were, of... like, we were only 13 years yeah, old. I was gonna say, yeah, pretty yeah. young, man. <laughs> Yeah, much like a lot of the well, a lot of the Swedish stories that way, you know, like a lot, very well, very. They don't young get shit else to do. Yeah, I guess so. Well, you guys, <laughs> you guys were on an uh, island though, right? I mean, you guys were kind of yeah. isolated. So. Yeah, we we lived on an island. Uh, it was like three, four hour ferry from Stockholm. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Up the Baltic Sea, yeah, Gotland, it's called. Yeah, very nice. See. Nothing medieval, else medieval town. <laughs> oh, cool. Now, but would, is that what you? Because, like I said, though, that is like a Swedish mold where they're like, there's a lot of talent, and it's like, is it truly because there's like nothing to do, or like, what would you assess that is where like all this music, and then being like, you know, really good at m- numerous instruments, especially just, the Swedes were always like more yeah. technically proficient than let's say like the Norwegian guys or whatever, you know? Yeah, like what's your? I guess what's your story? Where did music at least come into your life? Uh, well. I think for for me, I, I started to listen to music very early. My I had a big brother who was into punk rock and heavy metal and stuff, and uh, so I started to listen to it really early and um, probably had an interest in in uh, singing for for when I was growing up too. But um, it wasn't really until uh, when I started in uh, uh, when I was about thirteen. When I met the other guys, and we started to play in a band, and uh, the thing is that we have in Sweden, we were uh, <coughs> we were uh, there was like rehearsal places that we could uh, borrow for free when we were young. Is that something that the not... government provides or something for, yeah, for culture? Yeah, exactly. The government provided uh, uh, rehearsal places, or you can go to the uh, you know and there and rehearse and even get paid for it really when you're a kid yeah you have to fill in some forms and stuff so it re- you re- don't really get pay- paid in money but you get paid they get to uh, how do you you send in the mon- uh, the papers and then uh, they pay for the rehearsal place and stuff so are these so you re- don't have to no, go ahead i was going to say so are these uh rehearsal places designated rehearsal places because i know talking to like Peter from Vader, Poland obviously had something similar, but uh, it was mostly rooms in like factories and stuff. So there may be, he said, I think they said every, essentially every business or any factory, or whatever, had to, they all had to have a place of what, place of culture, I guess is what they called it, something like that. And uh, mm-hmm. it would be a designated place within that workplace or that building. So, so were these more standalone and all that was in there was rehearsal spots or was it within another facility? No, you can basically do it wherever you wanted to. You can be in a garage somewhere and just apply the forms and they they give it to but but there was there's also in a like in, in Stockholm for Gotland didn't have any special places for the rehearsal places with but we had some uh, uh what do you call it where youth hang out when after school and at nights we had like youth clubs and in the oh, cellar okay. they all had a like a rehearsal place you can go there and borrow the instruments and play around well, that's nice yeah, but we... also we, we uh, later on we found a 
a house inside Vis Visby where we lived, which was uh, funded by the government for a rehearsal. That's a rehearsal place, oh. and that's where we recorded. That's the Yellow House. We, as we say, the studio is on the Yellow House studio. Yes, yeah. That we, that's where that was basically our rehearsal place. Crazy. <laughs> and that was in the middle of town, where you know, you know, in the middle of town, and a uh, very fancy area, kind of. So that's, everyone hears this blazing death metal coming out of the house. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> were, was, were there any time was, constraints? Where you know, can you play at midnight, or I mean, were the police knocking no, on the they door? No, oh, they were not. We did, but they were never really happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, we got some complaints, but yeah. we, but we, you know, if you, as long as we did it before, it had to be uh, quiet at nine or something. Oh, nine okay. or ten. I can't remember. Gotcha. So going back to the corpse demo, then obviously uh, it wasn't you know your first thing to do, but it was definitely very early on as as far as the published works. Um, so like going back to that, hopefully there's any sort of you know it's not too far back to fathom, but like what was the you know thought at the time because that's like a lot different as far as style than uh, grave and you know really right. as I will go further uh, it, with my curiosity and. Uh, a lot. It was kind of also an early representation of a lot of the extremity, at least that projects that you have been involved in that always had. So, like, I guess to start out something more thrash-ish, like yeah, creator, yeah, like, merciless uh, stuff like that. Like, I guess why did it be? You know, was like a style like that, and then you know, obviously, then you know, you came more extreme and like a death metal route shortly after. Yeah, I think uh, corpse as you. Probably can tell by the logo as well. I'm not sure which logo is on that uh, EP or that album. Oh, look cool had, anyway. Uh, our logo was, <laughs> oh, you know, our you, logo you had the more exactly straight, like great. the straight letters. They were more more straight, right? Like, uh... yeah, we we totally ripped off Creators' logo. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm that's trying to pull it up. That's great. So oh. the, the the creator influence. Oh my God, that that's like that's like way off. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> cool. Nice. Oh, wow. You kind of had been mentioning the guys who you were in Corpse with and pre-Corpse, because I think it was, what, Anguish and maybe Torture or something were, were before yeah. Corpse? Yeah. And maybe a whole bunch of different names when you, you know, <laughs> you're still trying to figure out. Yeah, we it out. had a few names before we we settled down with one. <laughs> right. But you had mentioned your drummer was the more accomplished uh, guy in the band. And who, what, what was, who was that drummer at the time? Jensa. Oh, okay. So it was always always Jensa. It was always Jens, yeah. Okay. And he had more of a jazz background, you were saying? Well, his dad was a jazz drummer and his uh, uncle, I think, too. Okay. Well, it's funny because I was listening to some early early stuff last night going to bed. And um, I don't know. Maybe I just didn't think about it critically uh, in the past. But listening to Jensa play... Um, you know, he does these little things, not that it's jazzy whatsoever, but it, it's not typical of the time or the style where he's maybe doing more um, uh, quote-unquote like funky snare things while the double bass is playing. And I think that is um, uh, very uh, specific to Grave. Like, I didn't hear that. You don't hear that with Dismember, and you don't hear that with... I mean, Nikkei was... Uh, a fantastic drummer with with entombed and all that, but uh, you know he played more of that rock style. Where I felt like uh, with you guys, I feel a lot of the American bands rip that sure, style yeah. off. I mean, I hear even with Decrepit, the shirt I'm wearing, Chris Dora, uh, who played with Decrepit, does a lot of that Yensa style. Where you know yeah. it's that you know with the you know just kind of syncopated. I, I don't. I know. I, was, I never. Oh, well, I never listened to it like, like that. Okay. Well, syn it's more syncopated. You know, instead of just a yeah. straight, huh? You know, yeah. But I thought that I mean, was he was pretty always neat. a good drummer, and it had a different influences than many others. He was listening to, you know, lots of reggae and stuff too. So oh, okay. Maybe maybe that's he found the backbeat drums some sometimes, and I especially remember when we recorded for the Soulless album. I think there's a instrumental song called the Judas. Yeah. There's there's a snare with a delay on it. Pop, 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 like yeah. a reggae dub kind of snare. Thing. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, huh. we'll and we'll get to Solus because that was an important record for me. But uh, you know, we'll try to we'll try to keep in some kind of order. Yeah, well, yeah, make yeah. sense of everything. But yeah, no, but he was always, he he was always 
he was the one from beginning that could play. We didn't really play any instruments. Ole just started playing guitar when we when we met and formed the band, and I didn't even play anything. I just did the vocals at, at first, so yeah. I picked up the guitar uh, that year, kind of, you know. Nice. And started maybe right before we played Corpse. I probably have to had enough knowledge how to play. <laughs> well, that's and that's kind of a good uh, segue then where I wanted to go because then. I mean, I don't know, directly after it, because 1986 was the Corpse demo, and yeah. then after that, though, at least uh, as far as I think most people are aware, uh, is the Putrefaction Painful Death demo in uh, 1989, for which I guess your chops were up, uh, because that is now now you weren't doing vocals, uh, and it was Ole, and, and so you're now doing rhythm rhythm guitar, or at least as if this has any lack of information, <laughs> like the, because it had the wrong logo, uh, might have has long, wrong information, so... That as my source, the bootleg LP. Anyway, uh, it suggests that th that is the you know the credits the credits here. So uh, obviously things kind of progress for you that then you know he starts doing vocals and guitar as well. Uh, so like I don't know. I guess that's like now we're as you segue along. Like where did it like you go from? You know, like you said, you you kind of started as a vocalist then. So now that it's like you abandon that for putrefaction, and then he's doing like. What happened there? Like, well, was well he... I guess what came first uh -huh. is the question, Jorgen. I'm going to cut cut into his question and, and ask, like, it seemed like Putrefaction was more of a side project. So as Corpse evolved to Grave, did it all kind of happen all at once, or was Grave definitely happening before Putrefaction came into being? Oh, Grave was before Putrefaction. I, I, we can yeah. get to Putrefaction later. It was it was uh, one, uh, as you said, it was a side project. Okay. But, but uh, yeah, we after Corpse... Uh, we decided to change name into Grave, and uh, we changed bass player after a while. At the same time, we changed the uh, uh, name. So, and that was in '87, I think. Oh, okay. So yeah, a couple of years prior then. And who? Yeah. I guess who was influencing you at the time then to start? Uh, I guess that down tuning, sounding more death metal, taking it from that huge creator influence to. Uh, I guess a more extreme style. Who were the guys that you were hearing at the time going, oh shit, I mean, you can't even fathom what's happening, you know? No, but for, at that time we were discovering so many new bands all the time. It was It's kind of impossible to to keep track on which influenced us at, at what time. I can't really remember, but... <clears throat> sorry. Same time, I, when I listened to the first Grave demo, which is... Um, uh, called Sick Disgust Eternal. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure we listened to a lot of Blood Feast. Oh, <laughs> makes and, sense actually. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. And, Se and Sepultura. Ah, early, the, early stuff. Early Sepultura, yeah. And if, on the second second demo, uh, Sexual Mutilation. Oh yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we listened to a lot of Death. <laughs> I mean, it all is coming clear now that you're saying, yeah. that. <laughs> especially the Blood Feast one. I mean, I can yeah. hear, uh, oh man, is it R.I.P. when it's you know, it's sick, sick, disgust. Yeah, oh, yeah. exactly. Wow, yeah, that, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah. Sure. yeah, that's awesome. Love that album. We love that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's so the good. Face, face, that EP. <laughs> what? Well, um, you know, I wanted to press pause too on a second because uh, I just oh. kind of noticed this about the demo era. Because I, I totally botched that. I don't know why I went to like Putrefaction and didn't even think like Grave Era. Uh, I mean, demos, yeah. It, it's nineteen eighty eight, I guess, was the first, so I wasn't that far off. But anyway, the demo or the demo logo is very much still that thrash spirit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just I want to kind of point out the framework of it because it it's very much like. You know, Blood Feast Possessed, where you see what logos have become. Right. Where then you see the, the early ones, especially Possessed or whatever, <laughs> yeah, like where it's the 15 year old doodling at uh, math class. Yeah. Uh, so then it's like, yeah. Uh, so it's like the framework of what the grave logo then, you know, became more death metal looking. So yeah. just kind of wanted to point that interesting fact well, out. It's cool and, evolution. And it does get a little confusing because I feel like you guys had so many demos and then what promos and like, I don't know, it gets confusing of like, what came where and and what came when and there are all of these different uh, promo versus demo like what the hell is the difference and 
you know, I don't know. Well, especially when you're trying to have a conversation I, and the right. camera dies. The thing is <laughs> that I, the, the, I can't, for a short, I think the promos was never meant to be an official releases. They were just uh, things that we had to send to different labels at the time because they asked for more right. stuff. You know, and was, as for Century Media, for example, they asked for, oh, do you have any more songs? And we, we had released a third demo. And we said, like, yeah, we have a bunch of new songs. And so we had to go and record it, a few more songs to send it to him. Okay. And that's probably one of them. That was one of the promos, I guess. And we never really, uh, you know, put it out as a demo for sale. It okay. Just to record. So they never went into circulation. They just kind of started matriculating no. naturally. It circulated anyway, but we never really, you know, we sent it out, tape trading and stuff. So. Right, right. Okay, cool. So how did uh, Robert and the guys at Century Media start getting in contact? And Was it literally through you just kind of mailing stuff out, or did they get it on their desk from, from other tape traders? Or how did, it, how did it start, I guess? I can't remember really how they uh, picked picked us up, but I guess they were into the underground scene as well, and and you and it's all what was happening with Swedish bands, and they, you know, with Entombed and this member getting signed and Tiamat getting signed and you know, and they wanted to, you know, they saw what's happening in the Swedish scene, and they picked us up. Nice. Contact us over the phone. I I I remember he called us just, you know. And called us on the phone one day. <laughs> Simple yeah, as that. Yeah. I think it was my mom or my dad answered. You know, it's like, oh, it's some guy from Germany who wants to speak to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there was people all over the world called me at some, you know, sometimes. Right, right. Back because I was living at my parents' house, and they would, and the address was on the, you know, and it was not hard, that hard to pick to find a phone number. <laughs> right. <laughs> so people were calling from America and everywhere. My parents always answered. <laughs> they great. had me thinking, what the hell is this kid doing? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, what was their reception, though, more so to like when you're, you know, they're, they hear these demos and, and ultimately albums for the first time? Are they into it, or what's this noise? My parents? Yeah. <laughs> I think I know. Oh, <laughs> nah, I, I, wish I, could, I wish I could tell in Swedish, but uh, in English what they said, but... I don't really know how to translate it. <laughs> That's fine. I, your reaction was. It, uh, yeah, we, they, I think we got. That I mean, idea. They, were, they were not. They were not like they. They knew what kind of music I was listening to. Oh, that was not a shock for them that I started <laughs> playing that kind of music. But right. Uh, my dad was more like, uh, maybe you should start uh, concentrating on making some uh, proper music. <laughs> 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 Or get the job. <laughs> so were they very surprised then when it, it turned into something bigger? I mean, um... yeah, I think so. I, we, I guess we all were, you know. Right, right, true. <laughs> no, not really. Not anyone could see this coming, you know. Yeah. Fucking fifteen, sixteen-year-olds making noise, and then all of a sudden <laughs> get a record contract to get to tour in Europe. Crazy. You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't see that for. You couldn't yeah. see that one coming at all. No. Yeah, yeah. So, how old were you guys when you actually uh, signed with with uh, Century Media? Eighteen, maybe eighteen, nineteen. Okay. Kinda. So, literally, just of legal age to be able to even yeah. sign a contract. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I guess that was everybody's a lot of the same story, yeah, though. Guys, again, yeah. you know, and and so I guess even you know evolving or whatever the heck uh, in our timeline that didn't exist here. Uh, that, you know, obviously things are starting to happen, and you said that, yeah, you're more remote, I guess, by location. So where do you start meeting, I guess, the Stockholm guys? Like, because I, I would imagine, like, how far away was we that? Four, well, about four I, hours, and, and I say that loosely, too, because, like, I don't know, is Nick A and, like, Tomb guys, like, are they from Stockholm? Or, like, I, I'm not entirely sure, because I, I thought there was, like, maybe other cities uh, mentioned that could just be, like, a suburb of it or, you know, whatever. Yeah, no, no most of them... Uh... Not Nicky and Uffe and Entombed, Nihilist, uh, Dismember, Tiamat, Unleashed, all of them guys were from Stockholm. Okay. Then we have Merciless who lived a couple of hours, an hour away from Stockholm. But they were always in Stockholm at the gigs and stuff. And um, I think pretty much, I think around 1988 we were starting to go to gigs in Stockholm. We were coming more gigs into Stockholm, you know, underground gigs and uh, 
I think it was that Nuclear Assault was playing. Nuclear Assault and Exodus, yeah. I think, was the first time I ran into these guys. But we met them, uh, Ola had met them before because he lived in Stockholm for a while, and Jens had been up there because his sister li uh, lived in Stockholm, so he, he ran into them before that. But I think it was around that time, 88. And we started, you know, they they knew about us because they picked up our demo tapes at the local record store. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we knew them because we picked up their demo tapes. <laughs> <laughs> well, what was it like, though, playing show? I mean, they're on an island, right? About four hours, he said ferry, three to four hours. Right. I mean, getting gear, I mean, would you just borrow gear then from friends in Stockholm? Or did the venue have a back line? Or are you, like, bringing everything on the fucking we boat? We didn't get any gigs oh. until the 18th. I think. So later on, I think we hmm. we played uh, we played our first gig in this, in uh, uh, eighty nine, I think. Okay, was it in Stockholm? Nine or nine? No, it was in Norrköping, or maybe it was in a, it was like two or three hours away from Stockholm. Okay, so nuclear assault. Uh, an exodus it's yeah. like you know meeting the guys there it's like man you know grave and your career are really rounded in thrash <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. so where then does this more i guess because i've always thought like grave in by comparison to the rest of the swedish stuff i don't know if i would say like there's like a especially within tune with the, the deaf and roll thing like there was like more of i guess would be like d beat that was even in more of the you know, left hand pad stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That too, yeah. Punk, I guess, to be really more of the time period we're talking about when yeah. this is even coming out. And so, but Grave, like, it was more American right. uh, sounding, or vice versa. I don't know, you know, who could be credited first for anything. But, you know, the, but, but by the American comparison, uh, since a lot of the brutal stuff was in Florida, I guess more brutal. Um, like, would you agree with that? And like, where would you say that like that comes from? That stands out? Maybe the island, I guess. I I'm, I, I don't know really, <laughs> but I, I I mean, we didn't have any other guys to to change ideas with, right? Mm, yeah. You know, when we start, because there was nobody else in, at that island that was interested in that kind of music more than <laughs> us four and then a couple of friends, right? So what we what what we kind of we what we had to we learned from learn, listening to records basically and and not demo tapes you know we right. didn't get that much demo tapes tape trading until maybe 80 yeah 88 89 kind of so would you say that uh you know we brought up grave more demo era haven't really fully reached the first album cuz well then i guess putrefaction would be more chronological uh, at least conversationally, yeah. that, yeah, so you said that was more of a side project, so then where did that come from? It was basically, I don't know if what what uh, info you have on that one, but it was a guy <laughs> we'll called <see>. Jonas. <laughs> it was a guy, a friend of ours, Jonas, who was, uh, who had a, uh, <laughs> yes. him, 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 Jensen, Ola. Yeah, yeah, that's what it says. They they got drunk one night and and was in his garage with a, in their rehearsal place and they just did three songs one night and then they to like the day after they 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 called and said oh we got three more songs we need, we go and record it you can can you come and uh, play the guitar <laughs> need a second guitar <laughs> yeah sure so we went to uh, down to our rehearsal place and recorded it <laughs> so just a <laughs> drunk it. night nice and one of the uh, most sought after, uh, I mean, isn't J Dog's like favorite, one of his favorite demos of all time or something? It, I mean, if it isn't his, I love it. Yeah. I mean, like, what was like the, <laughs> what it, uh, I'm sorry, I was gonna say Ola, my, I forgot the per, the Swedish pronunciation, but it doesn't matter. His vocals on there are, are, are far more like, they're just, I don't know, they're crazy. <laughs> I, yeah. love, I just love it. Like, you know, I, I forget what song where it's just like, it sounds like a T Rex, just, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just like, what the, <laughs> so I mean, yeah, it's just, it's, it 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 embodies a character of its own, uh, and which is basically everything we're talking about. Like that, that's like like I said, I, I truly always kind of noticed that about you know like stuff that you're involved with. Like yeah, it's it does not fit the typical Swedish mold. It was always yeah, it's a little more brutal or something. Yeah, and uh, maybe maybe it is that like 
death and autopsy influence and that blood feast that he's that he well, mentioned. Well, it's also you know, who like, you hang out with, kind of thing, right? Um, so, but but yeah, I but I, wh- so how do you feel though about the vocals uh, on the Petrifaction? <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's super extreme. <laughs> but we always changed vocal uh, vocals on the early demos. It was me, Ola, and Jensa did almost every time one song each or so. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. It was no surprise. I knew all uh, <laughs> did vocals, but, <laughs> but they came out great on that recording for sure. And then you had another uh, side project too, wasn't it? Like grinding death or something, or uh, yeah, something like exactly. that. Exactly. There was also just a drunken <laughs> night and did re- <laughs> uh, nothing else to do than recording grindcore songs. So that was just was you just guys hanging so out. Stupid. Yeah. Huh? That was just you guys hanging out, being creative yeah. and and having a good time, really. Yeah, that's crazy. Basically. Well, that was just stupid, <laughs> but fun. I fun. mean, nobody could say that you're not productive when you're drunk. I mean, yeah. it's, I mean, like you said, that's a highly sought after demo. That if you had a closet full of original demo tapes, <laughs> yeah. hey, you'd be re- they only you'd be, getting, <laughs> you'd be financing your drunken future. <laughs> yeah, right. at least good. <laughs> Man, so now we're Maybe pretty I much shouldn't promote drinking though. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> this episode don't try not... it at home. <laughs> yes, or try it only at home. I don't yeah, know. Only I don't home. know where. <laughs> See, we don't even know how to sell it properly. <laughs> we are not the spokesman. Well, so then, I think we're probably by the point of Graves' first album, right? Yeah, into, into the grave. Yeah, and it's the promos or whatever. Yeah, minus the promos. Uh, but so I can, uh, we, let's uh, have a word on uh, the third demo too, because th- that's when we have discovered Carcass. Uh, oh, good. Yes, let's. Yeah. Now I gotta I gotta look at it again to be like, <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, the, yeah, that is definitely. Uh, I, pu- I could see pu- it now. <laughs> I could say putrefaction and the uh, and the third demo is definitely a lot of Carcass and stuff like that. I mean, you really can't just see a visual representation now that you've said that, that like by the, you know, as the a progression of the demos, because it has all the photos on the back of this LP. I have that LP, but I, I can't remember how it looked like. Actually. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, But then, so yeah, these aren't even official then, because then, well then, because Session Media has d- put out a collection, right? Of yeah. uh, grave demos. Is Putrefaction yeah. even on that? In the corpse? I <laughs> gotta know. <laughs> Not sure, really. Uh, yeah, it is. Okay. I have a, bo- a book tape cassette box here. That's oh, where cool. I, a Finnish uh, record label released it. Ah, well, that's, that's actually very really nice. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, and then that mimics like the originals. Uh, like a, it's a yeah. um, replica. Exactly. That's, that's awesome. Sweet. Yeah. Who put that out? Huh? Who put that out? Uh, Fluga. Oh, Fluga. Records. Yeah, they've been doing a lot. A lot of that kind of stuff. Yeah. I've been seeing it at Hell's. Yeah, they well, do a good job. Yeah, and, and that looked like uh, awesome. I, 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 I know which exactly one now you're talking about, but I haven't, I haven't looked at it that closely, so I, I want to go look at it. Uh, but especially. It, I think it's exactly the same as uh, Central Media did, but they got the rights to do the cassette version. Gotcha. So I, what is that like then to be, you know, here we are, we got the story of this. I mean, it's just essentially, yeah, guys, either they're drunk or they're kids, blah, 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 that like years later it's being put out on LPs and then they want to do a collection release. I mean, like how does that feel like to be at this point in time and that stuff's like going on? Like I'm sure you never thought that that would be the case. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I, I'm not sure. Sh- I, I just couldn't really think. I can't really say what we thought when we were 16, 17, or you know, in the teens, what we thought it's going to happen. But I'm, we we were, you know, looking f- forward all the time, and we wanted to have a record out, and we wanted to go, you know, be a, you know, re- release records and stuff. But looking back, back now, when I'm soon 50, I didn't <laughs> think it would happen. Really, no. When I listened to it, I was like, "Ah, oh, okay, maybe." Now, now no, it's it's a slim chance that this kind of music would, you know, break through. Right. Yeah. Is, is there any things that you listen to now, uh, like some of those demos or some of the early stuff, where you just like smack your head and go, "Oh man, 
this is rough or do you really no. just find is it like a fond a fond memory you know no and yeah i don't really no i don't just uh, feel embarrassed of it yeah never. good no you shouldn't <laughs> no. but like to be so like we more more surprised sometimes when i listen to it because <laughs> So when I listened to the first grave demo, I was like, "Wow, how how were we thinking? You know, when we wrote those songs, because I I would never write write a song like that today. Right, right. 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 You know, I could, yeah. could never come up with those riffs again. And you know, I was like, "Oh, that that was some great ideas, but <laughs> what happened? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> how do how, you know? Just yeah, that's awesome. young and creative, as you said. You know, we just." That's what we did. We didn't do much else than hanging around in the rehearsal room and yeah. recording stuff. But you said you had uh, like this LP then, and and I don't know if you said you've seen this or had that. But like, how does that like? Obviously, it's like not official. It, it lacks a, cr a proper demo. <laughs> maybe even some yeah. information. Like, you know, when you see that though, is it like, is it flattering? Does it piss you off? Like, what what is like? How does that feel? A little bit of both. It <laughs> depends on what they release, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean the demos. I don't, I don't get pissed off at that because it's uh, uh, still, you know, I'm not embarrassed about them. Right. You know, it's a time. I recall it. It's it, what it is. What it is. What it is from that time, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, some, some I seen some bootlegs with live recordings that totally suck, and you know? I can't really, <laughs> can't really, you know. Why would they ever <laughs> bother to put that out? Because it sounds like shit, you know. <laughs> but do you embody the fan spirit that, like, favorite bands of yours that you would collect a ass-sounding bootleg as well? Of course, I did just buy some bootlegs over the years that don't sound that good. So, uh... <laughs> so at least you understand. The I, I guess. I guess I understand, but <laughs> but it's my music. I can't yeah, understand yeah. why. You're... Something that I played and sounds like shit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting to I guess into the grave uh, ninety one. I guess the first question is, what is up with the silver strip? Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that wasn't your choice. No, I was as surprised as everybody else. I guess when we <laughs> we had the album in our hands and we're like, what's this? <laughs> what's <laughs> what's up with the silver strip? Was it more because, like, uh, I mean, to me, the grave logo is, I mean, it's very obvious. You could, you know, it's not a jumbled mess like some logos are. You know, I mean, you can clearly see it says grave. Uh, yeah, but maybe. Especially on the demo. I guess it is a little darker, the artwork, and I don't know. Maybe it was like a yeah, clarification. Yeah, in the artwork, you know? they, they, exactly. In the artwork, they had it in the middle, and it was, you know. Uh, it branching strings. out everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is fit into the album cover, so it, I guess it was because they didn't think people would see which, which uh, album it was. Yeah, which so uh, they, a little silly, but I was all yeah. the record company did it, so I, I, we never had any saying of that. Yeah, they didn't talk, told us either, what I can remember. So. We're like you and the guys real pissed off, like what the fuck, or you just shrug your shoulders. And <laughs> yeah, go, ah. we questioned it, but <laughs> yeah. then we just ah fuck it. <laughs> We got a record out. But, uh, fuck it. Yeah. Yeah, it's already out. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, but how was that then? As you know, it's finally all this effort of the demo days is now becoming a full length album and something that's obviously either, yeah, you know, you get record labels that call a different shot and, and then you get a product in your hand that's fucked up or whatever. And it's like, you know, obviously it's just, it's the start of something bigger. So, like, you know, when you're even focusing on that cover art. Was that like? Did you have a uh, a hand in that? Did you have a specific artist you want, or you know stuff like that? No, because uh, none e either of us was ever interested in the artwork kind of bit doing the demos either. It was always like a little bit of a struggle, <laughs> and we didn't have any people that could. We didn't know any people that could paint and stuff. So Central Media. Uh, had this artist, uh, oh, I can't remember his name now, but he did the first album. He did a lot of uh, uh, Central Media releases. Yeah. Unleashed and uh, Tiamat and Grave, Asphyx. He did a lot of stuff. Now, when it comes down to naming this one, as we uh, <laughs> found out with the demos, was there, uh, 
You know, we were beyond car. We were at, at last the demo. We were at Carcass and right, Frost. right. Was there a, <laughs> anyone for Who's the, the next? now for the album? Or <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That was, uh, I guess, at the uh, when the album came. I think we kind of knew what we were, <laughs> what we sounded like. But it's it's also you know it's since '86. That's like four years or so. Yeah. Until we kind of okay, this is how we sound like. It's not like it happened over a day. Right. You know, it's a mix of everything on that album, you know, from from early, from, you know, Corpse to to that date. Um, so I guess that's kind of when we found, figured out, oh, this is how we sound like, you know. So as far as the recording process, did were you allowed to choose Sunlight? Um, obviously, some other guys had already started uh, using using Thomas over there. Is that something that you mm-hmm. pushed for, that you wanted to go there? Or did they they just send you there? No, the thing was that we, when we signed with uh, Central Media, they uh, invited us to Germany, and we recorded a week in a German studio. Oh, okay. Uh, for that, uh, I don't know if you have that 7-inch Tremendous Pain. Oh yeah, yep. I mean, I, I the, yeah, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, and there was a, also a compilation album called "Into the Eyes of Into Death." Eyes of Death, yeah. yeah. And we had a couple of songs on that too, and um, it was recorded in a German studio, and we really, really didn't feel comfortable being in that studio, and we didn't really like, we couldn't really communicate that good with, you know. In yeah, English language or, barrier, yeah. or in German, right, right. So when we, when they asked, or when after that experience, we said, "Oh, we have to play, we have to record in Sweden because we don't really know how to get, you know, our message through here. Right, <laughs> we're right. not that experienced. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was the German so studio? The only obvious reason was to really Sunlight Studio, and we said, yeah. oh, "Okay, let's try it out," and we didn't really want to be be seen as a, or you know do it as the, everybody else recorded there but it was not really we didn't really know any other place that could uh, record and sound that kind of you know sound that brutal at the time so. right so with that German studio going back to that real quick so were these guys like did they even know metal at all were they more just like engineers that dealt with rock music and stuff was it was that part of the struggle like they just did not know how to like Handle this style of music. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, had, it was there was two German guys. Uh, there were two German guys that had a studio, and they didn't know much English. Uh, I don't know what they recorded earlier. Really, I have no idea. Uh, but they also brought in a guy who knew English and had recorded or had uh, done some uh, live shows with Obituary. Oh, okay. So he kind of he kind of knew uh, death metal. Okay. But, it was really new to him too, so he, yeah. we didn't really get through that well. Gotcha. Together. So at least Sunlight had an idea. He was doing that kind of work. It was obviously in your native country. Uh, but mm. what's up with the? I mean, obviously everyone knows now, but he was using a lot of pads and and D drum triggers for the bass drum and the toms, and most people brought their real snare and cymbals, but everything else was was sampled um, and triggered. So. I, I think I heard that you guys were one of the only ones back then to use real toms, but I don't know if that's accurate or not. Yeah, we I, we uh, actually th- talked about it a while ago, me and Ola and and Jonas, but we can't really remember wh- what we changed. Oh, okay. <laughs> we did. We did. I think, as you say, I think we real, used real toms, but kept uh, D drum kicks. Okay. There is some, yeah, because there is a, a sound quality to it that isn't like the, the typical sunlight that everybody, right. you know, when you say that. Yeah. But there's something sunlight exactly about it at the same time <laughs> yeah, right. because then there's other sounds. I want, I, and, and it, I could be thinking of something wrong, but I'm pretty sure, like, I almost heard, like, what I couldn't come up with a better example is, and it's a bad example, is DeSaltry's, uh, 
Well, a lot of their stuff, actually. Because they were another uh, the band that they didn't sounded, sound like anyone yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. So I thought it, it shared similarities there. And and it was definitely drums. There was definitely something I noticed in drums. Okay. Um, so I don't know if it was Tom's. I'm going to have to go back and listen a little bit closer. Because you can kind of think about, like, thinking, I'm playing some of the classics in my head. <laughs> where, like, yeah, it was drum, the, like, you can hear, hear like, some fills. Mm-hmm. Where it's, yeah, it's got a, a, a an electronic quality about them. Um, you definitely, so maybe if you pay that. attention, you could tell. But Yeah, yeah. But overall, I think they did a good job. And mostly, wasn't it just because that studio was tiny and he really couldn't fit full yeah. kits and full setup? I mean, he had to just do what yeah, he had to do. Yeah, it was really, really small. Yeah, right. He only had one at the time. At that time, he had one small recording room and a, and a control room. Yeah. And it was... Uh, it was in a basement? Know, no communication between the rooms here. <laughs> yeah. Really basic. <laughs> you know, it was really, really... Everything was just analog and really punk rock <laughs> kind of that thing. There was not, there's no fancy things or whatever. Well, and small, you know, no, no uh, windows. So it was in the basement. It was dark <laughs> all the time. You know, coffee machine and cigarette smoke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how it should Let's be. Make a record. Yeah, that's how it should be. Well, it's <laughs> funny. <Good. laughs> yeah. It's funny because, but yeah, I think it was as you said. It was because it was really small. They had, you know, he couldn't really fit big kits in there. Right. And right. also because he also, all I think he already always worked with those before, so he knew what sound he could get out of it. Right. And at the at that time, you never had any budget. Yeah, you know, right. There was no budget to talk about. <laughs> I think at first. Album we recorded and mixed it in ten days. Oh wow! Yeah, it's pretty wild. So you did vocals like two nights, yeah, or something. All the songs. That's pretty intense. Losing yeah. your voice. Um, well, it's funny because last night we had a uh, a, a crazy storm and uh, we actually lost power here. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking, I heard a story. I don't know if it was for the record, Into the Grave, but uh, didn't you have a weird thing where like all the power went out, like you were like doing vocals or something? Maybe I don't know. You, you'll have to, to tell the story, but I thought I heard something like that. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. It okay. was uh, one of those nights when we did all the vocals, and it was like, also like real bad weather outside. Uh-huh. And um, I can't remember which song it is though, but there's this like a spoken part in the middle of the song. Okay. It's a little bit, little bit evil, you know. <laughs> few evil words in there, and all that when I did that speaking part, all the lights shut down. We <laughs> shut down. It was pitch dark and kind of got out of there, and we were, walked out, and the whole town was black. It was you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. No power at all. It's because of you. It's because of the, the force. some incantations yes. or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where does that was, put us in our timeline? Because that I would, I, it kind of is an appropriate. Uh, well, there's only so two, so many grave albums. Then well, there's EPs. I feel like between everything. Yeah, yeah, but it'll stay. Because I mean, you can kind of a lot of that's more recording based or, yeah. or whatever, and, and tours and stuff. But I don't know. I, I like the progression through having all these different projects. At least I guess is more of the interest. I'm, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, highlighting this time around. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, so soon after that, it's uh, like, was there, why did you eventually start doing, You, I mean, you weren't doing Grave anymore. What, like, you know, <laughs> what happened with that? What? Just to basically disembark from doing Grave uh, material, because that's something like, mm-hmm. you know, after the first two albums, maybe there's an EP or something else I'm forgetting in there, but then, you know, you moved on, and I guess what would be yeah, after, after that? After Solace, you moved huh? y- Yeah, so would it be like you're in, entombed at that point, or... Or no, is that yeah? True? Well, yeah, base, yeah. After we, we did uh, three albums together, we played uh, and a few EPs, yeah, and then uh, did a lot of touring, and you know, and we've been together for about ten years as a band, and we're starting to get on each other's nerves a little <laughs> bit. So, you know, living in small vans, and you know, it's yeah. it's hard work basically if you want to tour. And on that um, level, right. So I kind of got fed up with it and uh, decided to leave the band in '95. 
uh, and then uh, shortly after I uh, got asked to play a show with uh, Entombed in Sweden because their bass player was uh, out of town and uh, shortly after that they asked me to join the band and that was a, a kind of a, a nice uh, little run then really because then you were in you know on several albums and even through uh well that was shortly like Nick A was then kind of on his way out from the project then and it, right because he was only like one yeah well you. I, I was as I, when I started in 95 they were in between record labels so they didn't really have a they had released Wolverine Blues and then they yeah. wanted to get out Eric records so when I joined them they were in a in between albums kind of and it took a very long time before everything was settled with a new label and everything. I think he got fed up on during that time. But we recorded the album and we did some touring. And then he uh, decided to leave. Nick, yeah. It's admittedly like I am was playing a little bit of catch up with a lot of your uh, discography after Grave, really. And, and, and just, you know, there's been a lot of stuff that, like, you know, I, I knew... Uh, that you, I, I didn't really, I didn't know that you had involved with, uh, with Entombed, but I've obviously heard those records, and so yeah. like it's more of the, uh, you know, Death and Roll era, and, and more yeah. of stuff that uh, you know kind of just embraced different stuff than just the you know left hand path and clandestine, which uh, you know as I've said, obviously your body of work has definitely sounded different to that, but it's also more in the spirit of at least you know the early grave. Uh, and and everything before that uh, in like you know left hand bath style uh, that it's more than to to suit that fan base than more of the I guess the death and roll as it went so I I've, obviously it would be dumb to even ask what you thought of death and roll and where that went because obviously you didn't think it sucked <laughs> but <laughs> but you know like to be of that era of entombed I guess like is there ever been I don't know like is there ever been an interesting dynamic from fans. Because, like, I guess where we're at well, here... Like, well, we should subtract. We, we should, I mean, not subtract. Rewind a second. Because yeah. I think with Soulless, really, the Grave changed. And I know a lot of diehard Grave fans, like, don't like Soulless, but then a lot do. For me, I fucking love Soulless. I think those are the best written songs of the career, of your career as far as, like, the songwriting goes, period. But they mm -hmm. added more of this, like, groove element, right? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't Death and Roll per se, I mean, it just had more of a groove. And so did you get a lot of flack for that? I guess that's probably where the flack might have started with if we were talking flack If we're talking bands, flack, I, mean, you know? I don't really care all that much about flack. I'm just kind of curious, yeah. though, if, you know, as a nerd, because you'd be like, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's like Star Trek conversation right now. <laughs> like, you, you know, like, what did just, I, I don't know. I think we, I don't think I need to explain it any further. I think we get it. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, I, I guess there was a lot of people who didn't like the way some bands turned out, you know, yeah. after a while, and some, but we also gained a lot of other fans as well. So that's that's just what happens when bands change a little bit. Right. It's always always going to be that hardcore, hardcore fans. It's not going to like it. Yeah, you know, and, and you're... diehard fans will not like any band changing that much. Yeah. And I think I formulated a little bit better rounded question to it. It's like as to obviously be the creator of that music, was it somewhere that, as you were saying, as you're, you know, getting sick of being in vans with the guys and in, in, in grave and stuff and moving on, was it also more of musically interesting to you too, because you were kind of more, you know, done with, or just, you know, wanted to expand a little bit. And that was an opportunity. Yeah. yeah well, musically it was not, you know, as a musician, it was not really challenging anymore to, you know, do the death metal, yeah. Only kind of thing. So I was kind of looking into other, other genres and stuff. But I'm not, you know, never started any other bands. But I was definitely wanted to play something else than grave songs, for sure. And uh, I also at the same time when I was uh, when I left Grave, I was uh, in a band with uh, my good friend uh, Kenta. Uh, and he, he had a band called Leukemia, and uh, I started actually playing with them for a while. But then, when Entombed asked, I had to, you know, at the same time, you know, be with Entombed. So I was in both bands for a while there too. And, okay. the, and the Leukemia was a bit different than other bands too. They were more 
thrashy kind of death metal. I can I don't really know how to say. It. <laughs> yeah, the, the genre. <laughs> but it was yeah, it was it was a bit different anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, uh, well, if we can kind of touch back on Solus for a minute. Is yeah. that was that a natural evolution with all the guys? Did anyone push it in that direction? Was everyone kind of moving that way? Because I when you when you left, I just felt like Grave failed to me. Because I didn't like Ola's vocal approach on Grave. I felt like they got more hardcore and, and more of that. Uh, I guess they, they started kind of doing what Entomb did, and you guys all kind of evolved in their, your own different way. But I just didn't, uh, it didn't resonate with me, and I still can't listen to Hating Life. Like, I can't listen to that record. Like, I, I, don't, any, I don't even think I own it. But I just, I just didn't like it um, as a follow-up to Solus as a fan. So I don't know what you can comment on any of that, but. There's some honesty there. <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ola. Like yeah. <laughs> yeah, well. I guess I figured like <laughs> Jorgen must have wrote I mean, everything. I, he was he was the he so, was the good Solus one. Was, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Solus was definitely a, an approach we, we all took you know, and and uh, liked. It was not not like just one of us wanted to go that direction. It was a natural progression. Uh, I don't know where it came from, really, you know, going to be more groovy, but I think it was a lot of the uh, Jensa didn't want to play that much fast songs anymore because it was, it was he, you know, he wanted to play some, some slower stuff, okay. more like, uh, you know, groovy stuff. Yeah. So he kind of blended in into our death metal more and more. But the Entomb had also did it, done it with the Wolverine Blues, and this right. member also did. Uh, I can't remember which one it is, but they also slowed down a bit. Oh, like Casket kind of, Garden and stuff. It, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It kind of was in the time, you know. Everybody was. Everybody's recorded a th two or three albums, been on tour a lot, playing the songs, and kind of got fed up with uh, playing it for a long time too. You know, it, yeah. it was almost, you know. It's pretty natural for a band to progress that way. Right. A lot. Of, I think others have cited it as grunge, uh, kind of getting in there, uh, in there for them. But was I that think anything? grunge had a, had a part of it too, because it was around that time, right? Nine yeah. four, nine five. Nine. Yeah, and more of the underground stuff, though. I wouldn't say underground, but like Sonic Youth and and kind of the early mm -hmm. stuff. I would imagine would have been more of the the influence, right? Yeah. Well, it's, I know for a fact that the like. Uffe and Nicky and the guys from Entomb, they love that stuff. Yeah. The punk, the punks, punk rock stuff, and they always love the punk rock stuff. And for them, it was a natural progression, I think, for to incorporate that more into Wolverine Blues and later on the To Ride album as well. Right, right. We were not that much in Grave. We didn't really like. We were not influenced by any punk bands. We. Not more than you know that we listen to it every now and then, but there was nothing we ever discussed, talked about, about uh, bringing more punk influences or nothing. But it was, yeah. I guess it was just around that time, you know, it was about to change. Right. Uh, right. Uh, we were we really liked uh, prong. Ah. Prong. I guess that makes some sense. Yeah. 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 Uh. That makes sense when you're listening to Hating Life. <laughs> huh? Yeah, that might, well, because uh, there is. Oh man, what's maybe the some big to differ in there, but well, well, but like there, it, there is like a. Uh, well, I'm sorry, because there's. I might uh, be getting ahead of myself though too, because there's also um, what project that you told me off with Dirk off camera? You told me. Oh, uh, Project Hate. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there mm -hmm. is so like, Project Hate has like some of the industrial aspect where like Prong was doing stuff like that. With like cleansing and uh, root awakening, especially like, uh, am I wrong or would were these are those the prong records you even talking about? Yeah, well, prong was always a, a band that we liked in a grave, but yeah, as you say, if you listen to Hating Life, you can hear a lot of prong influences on that album. Huh. I, that's that is some, if you listen to it and think about it. Yeah. That's cool though because uh, I love just, I love force fed. But, yeah, force fed is like shit. But, but, but yeah. not not saying that they try to sound like prong or anything. Right, or right. 
something like that, but it's definitely put that groove going that direction, kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's, now, it's cool to hear them say that, actually. Well, yeah, that's and that's actually why I'm highlighting it because uh, nobody ever mentions prong. I know. Well, force fed. <laughs> so, uh, most people don't know well, that, that era, though. though. Yeah, and Barney then Barney did. mentioned it, and I'm like, yes, like, all right, cool. Yeah, like, Barney from Napalm. Well, dude, uh, yeah, force fed primitive origins. So, I love that. Like, so but good. then you know, like, ah, beg to dare. Like they they got weird. They are yeah, not yeah. weird, but different. Like every album was like really different. But that early they, shit, yeah, is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So just we had, just had to highlight that. <laughs> but we, it also we love we love Beg to Differ. We listen to it a lot. Yeah. Uh, when when it came out, and uh, also cleansing and the uh, Rude Awakening too. I actually liked cleansing too. <laughs> yeah. A snap. We love finger. that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fingers. Yeah. That's funny. It kind of makes sense now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Well, and that's like interesting to me because i do feel tommy to yeah and, and move aside with it as well yeah. but like with that whole yeah how you said people didn't like you know soulless and whatnot i also i, I did make the remark of like you know where you are and maybe the, just the fandom that you have surrounding you it's like you know the guys that we know that would have been you know <laughs> yeah. they would have the, been the elitist yeah, dudes, yeah yeah that that's kind of more of where our perception might be right and so like yeah, you never hear about prong or something like that. That that's not from like, those guys. Exactly. Yeah. So to be like, I'm like, well, I didn't, you know, I kind of did like those. So th- that yeah. kind of thing, where like, it's when it's finally brought up, it's it's interesting because it's kind of a light bulb of like where yeah. what made that sound the way that it did, why they felt the way they did, and then you look at the year and you're just like, oh yeah, yeah they probably sense. would think prong or Sonic Youth. Uh, was okay yeah right <laughs> so like you know, it was but it was never clarified like you know how many uh conversations can we go and listen to you like talking about this stuff to that level yeah. to get all those nitty gritties it would just be like you know how was it recorded or what was the tour, was the tour like? like yeah, yeah. <laughs> just like the i don't care about common the interview tour. questions yeah <laughs> yeah I, i'm not sure if i ever ever actually talked about prong in interviews before <laughs> see there so, you go. We're, we're uncovering <laughs> new ground here that's amazing <laughs> This interview, Mike, like Grave, does not want to be the same. <laughs> <laughs> so, the you know, ongoing theme, I like it. <laughs> yeah. Now that I just derailed it, though. Well, I want to know. What, I want to know what you thought of hating life. Yeah. Uh, I haven't listened to it in a long, long time, though. First time I listened to it, I thought it was all right, but I think they could have done better. And then uh, second time, or uh, another time, I listened to it, and I. I thought it was actually pretty okay. Yeah. Because I kind of knew where we were going. So I, I had rehearsed some of those songs and stuff, but, uh, you know. Well, you can understand, though, me as a fan. At least today, I don't know. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. But you have to understand, like, me as a fan, like, I loved Solus. And that was right around there I discovered you guys because I'm a little younger, you know. I was, uh, what was Solus, 93 or 94? Yeah, yeah, ninety four. Ninety four. So I was like thirteen when I discovered you guys, and then I obviously grabbed the the earlier albums once I had Solace and loved it, but and loved those. But yeah, when Hating Life came out, I was so into Grave more so than Entombed and everything at the time. Actually, uh, I, you know, it was just a, such a disappointment for me. And, and seeing that you left, you know, I'm just a young a young kid listening to to Grave, right? So I'm like, ah, he must have been the the songwriter. These right. guys suck, like. <laughs> You know, it must have been Jorgen doing all this shit that was good. You know, so that that's why some of those yeah. questions came up before about to, you know with someone pulling or pushing direction. But but you know, I don't know the difference. I was just like listening, like and everything changed. So I blamed it on them and was like, I gotta follow you wherever this guy goes. I gotta follow Jorgen. So, so that's kind of funny. <laughs> well, that was not no, that was not the case though. Right, right. You know, we all wrote songs together, and from day one, we were all involved in the songwriting. Yeah, that was just, you know. Don't, I, so don't blame them. No, I yeah. know, I know. There was a little bit of blame, yeah, I thought. Yeah, just funny, just funny. He was just saying, it sucked, yeah. dude. He's <laughs> getting get pretty harsh. Eh? Well, so where are we at in our timeline then? Because I, I already forgot the name of the project that we oh, set pro- up. Project with. 8. Yeah. yeah. So is that is that where we are, though? That's I don't know. I mean, well, this well, is the confusing part. Uh, we talked part. about leukemia, and the, uh, right. Kenta is uh, the guy who has uh, started the Project 8. Oh, uh, Lord, Lord, I don't know his real name, but Lord K. Phillipson. Or, or exactly. <laughs> his name is, we can just call him the K. K. For, okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. His name is Kent. Okay. Well, he was in leukemia and we were good uh, friends and I, 
started playing with them there in '95 too. And then we, he had, I, well, he did some other stuff in between. Then he started to uh, uh, play around with his new band, and he asked me and the LG to come down to the studio when we were on tour to record a few songs for his new demo, which ended up on being this band, the Project Hit. Okay. And that was '97, I think '98. So something yeah. Like that. In a Don Svanus studio. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's a very different, you know, Project Tape was always cool. Yeah, I remember getting the first one uh, just because it was so diverse. And it's funny that you mentioned Swano because when we were talking before we turned on the, the computer here and set up for the interview, we were just kind of talking about this and what we were going to talk about with you today. And I was like, yeah, Project Tate's kind of like a uh, Swano project. I'm like, it's kind of all over the place. There's orchestral stuff. There's chick singing. There's... Some industrial, there's or you know whatever. Uh, there's still really intense death metal parts. But yeah. I'm like, it, I, I was just like, it's kind of like a Swano thing. Yeah. And so it's funny that uh, yeah, he was involved too. But yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. it, it is a, it is a very different uh, band. We knew it. We tried to in the in the beginning. We've done 13 albums now. Yeah. This, so it's not yeah. like we've been. It's been around for a while, but. Uh, in the beginning, we we tried to do live shows and stuff, but we could never really nail it. Yeah, because there's so much. There's a lot of shit going on. It's a lot of shit going on. <laughs> the songs are pretty long, and you know, and we could never nail it that good. So when we said, "Now, oh, fuck it, let's just make a studio band out of it," and it evolved to something completely different, <laughs> you know, because yeah, he could, because can't. Kent is a genius, right? Yeah. And he can, that's his baby. And whatever, whenever he does something, it's the best shit he ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it is. Yeah. He loves it, you know, and he puts so many hours into it. And he, you know, all the or he does all the orchestral stuff and he does yeah. all the, you know, he's just a genius. But he, at the same, you know, it's hard to, uh, have a band that never tours or so, so right. Uh, it's hard to get out with the music, and then also because it's so different. But we still managed to done, have done thirteen albums now, and as you said, Dirk, Dirk is playing on a couple of uh, yeah albums, two, three, I think, think yep, four maybe. Trying to piece together and, uh, locations again. We got and uh, Lars from Candlemas is playing guitars. And, oh, nice. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, Craig, we were talking before, and Craig didn't know that you had played uh, with Candlemass live. I mean, is that was that just for uh, a handful of shows, or did you actually like perform live with them for some years? No, they. It was I had I helped them out when they. Oh, okay. Had, uh, when they needed someone to play guitar or bass, because they couldn't. You know, as we all get older, it's hard to fit everybody's schedule and. Right. You know, and they want to do some shows, and then the the guitarist was away, so I stepped in and did guitars for a couple of shows or festivals, and then, I've, you know, then Leif couldn't play for a while, and I had to play, I was asked to play bass for a while. So it's pretty amazing. It was not. It was not. A, I was never a member, but right. I was uh, standing. But yeah. it had to be awesome though, playing oh, with them. Totally. Yeah, it was amazing. You know, because I, when I grew up, I was listening to them all the time. And yeah. When I first, you know, I got real nervous when they asked me first. Because <laughs> I was playing with I was playing with Leif in a other band we had, Crooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, right. I was just about to bring it up. Yeah. So we played together and he called me and said, oh, can you play guitar for us, we have a few shows coming up, and I was like, "No, nah, I'm not really that good on playing guitar." But he insisted, so. And we, when we rehearsed, I was like, you know, goosebumps all over. <laughs> it's hard to concentrate playing all that. those songs. It was just amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, and so bringing up Candlemass, Dan Swano, and then you know where we are at in our timeline. Um, I was trying to piece together. Well, we were, before we were talking about locations and stuff and where you're from. And Swan himself, especially when we were talking to him, he's, you know, he's talking about like Quarthon. Well, they're in the, then they're on Black Mark and stuff. So it sounded like he was in an entirely different spot in Sweden. Yeah. And then I don't I don't know where Candlemass is 
uh, from particularly at least as far as major city, but I'm pretty sure that's not it's not Stockholm and it's a different area in and of itself. Um, so like, where did uh, and then and then Dan mentioned doing uh, unorthodox and uh, yeah. the part that he was singing and he said uh, Leaf was in just came in. And he's like, here's my hero getting to sing the death metal guy and then wailing his heart out with some oh that's uh, right yeah. soft spoke or singing part. Um, so like it just seems like a like that the candle mask guys are kind of like overlooking their <laughs> younger generation or something, <laughs> and then like but like where's the proximity of this? Like where did you meet Dan to then want to even do a recording with him? Oh, Dan was a friend of he lived in the same town as uh, Kenta. Oh okay, because Dan is from uh, a couple of hours away from Stockholm, and then he moved from there to Örebro, which which uh, Kenta lived as well. Okay, and they they hanged out and they had a studio there, and and Kenta recorded a lot of stuff with him. So that's how I met Dan as well. Cool. And where's Candlemas from then? Candlemas from Stockholm. Oh, they are. Okay. Oh, okay. Well then, that makes that sense yeah, for, right. for that. But but yeah, so then you do the the Crux project, and I mean, so that's that's not even like at least according to Metal Archives, that's that's a still an ongoing project. And then you've got like what three or four albums? Three albums. Yeah. And that's just something we did you... three albums. But oh, I'm sorry, um, I can't remember when we released the last one. Uh, it was a few years back now. But. Uh, it's not. It's not. We never said we have quit, but right. You know, and then every, every now and then, the, uh, someone calls us and asks if we want to play live, and at least we, you know, we talk about it. <laughs> then, we, <laughs> then we kind of we were close once. I get, and I guess not, that not not too long ago, but it's just hard when everybody's different bands. We got Frederick, who is in Opeth. Yeah. He's out touring all the time, and and there's Leif and Candlemas. Right. Then uh, we had uh, Peter, who was in the tomb too. Yeah. On drums, but he's, you know, so it's hard to, hard to get everyone together. And the last record was 2011, by the way. So it has but, been has been some time. And I and I make I make that remark though of like being done or not because I guess it was more so like you said like everybody having their different bands and so like it got I guess was it's it's said at least by some that like it was like it made it sound like there was like Leif's answer to uh, Candlemas that was I guess you know on the rocks at the time. I mean I I just know that from a fan perspective that there was a whole reunion with Messiah and that was the right. self-titled Candle Mass album. So it to I guess to coincide with that as a project and then especially yourself having involvement with uh Candle Mass as a live uh member uh you know I guess it's just like it's just like one of those things like where as a fan or especially a younger one it's like how could he do m- like more than one band at once, you know that that or similarly <laughs> doom and all that. So would you agree though with that statement that like it's is it even? Because I guess if you were to say that like Crux is the answer to Candlemas, at least as far as Leaf's concerned, that that's almost like a similar style or something. Would you agree that's even in the same realm as it? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I think for. If we bring it back a little, you know, a little back how it formed, it was me and uh, Kenta again, and uh, and Peter who started the uh, Doom project. Yeah. We called we called it Devil Sun. And uh, we re- we record uh, we rehearsed and then we asked uh, Leif to join us on bass. On a, at the party, and he agreed, and we never thought he. Would. <laughs> but he agreed to, to come down and jam with us, so we were like, "Oh, awesome!" <laughs> so he came down. We we did a few, you know, we rehearsed a couple of times, and it was good fun. Then that band never happened anymore. Uh, 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 I can't remember what we uh, right. never. <laughs> but um, I think it was at the same time as they had a reunion with Messiah, and Leif had a bunch of. Uh, songs written for a new Candlemas record but those rec- those songs couldn't re- really didn't uh, fit Messiah's vocals he thought okay and that became the first Brooks album yeah that's the one I own I just have the first one I think it's okay. really cool yeah, yeah. and uh, then he said so he said okay I got this bunch of songs can we record them can you and Pete come and record them with me and um, uh, 
and we call it a different, have a different band name for it. But uh, he enjoyed playing with us, and we loved playing with him. And so he asked us to record the album with him, and we got Matt Levin on vocals. And then at the time, uh, Frederick from Opeth did the uh, lead guitars. But he, I don't think he was in Opeth at the time. He was in other bands. By the right. Time. Quite the entourage then. As oh, yeah, far well, as I, I always thought it was a project, like a supergroup thing. I remember, I think, I think even the label uh, maybe marketed it that way at the time too. Uh, I think to get you they know, all did right. So as soon as yeah, a few yeah. friends get together, it's just a super band <laughs> right, coming right, out. Right, right. <laughs> but I remember really being into it. It was like right at the time where. I I kind of it's funny because we talked about me not accepting grave with hating life and them kind of moving into that more hardcore even uh, uh, death and roll ish style, mm. whereas like entombed I always maybe because it happened so early with like Wolverine Blues and I love that that like I always like gave the pass to entombed but I didn't give the pass to anyone else because it, maybe entombed did it better or something I don't know, but. Uh, <laughs> Hard to search your kid's self. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, exactly. I don't know what the hell I was thinking at the time, but but in tune was always okay to me. Same difference, like all that shit. Took a minute, but I I really liked it. Whereas like yeah, hating life, I couldn't accept and shit. You know, I don't know why. But uh, Eddie Oregon. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Blamed him. Yeah, he left, so it sucked. <laughs> No, but he was in it. He was on. He was on those entombed oh, yeah, yeah, records. That's right. See, that all it all came back it, together. It's all there. That's it's right. all. It's all here. So see, see it, it did. Sense. It did right. make sense to my my young brain. He yeah. he left. He's quite the fanboy. <laughs> See, thought hating or thought solace su- or hating life sucked, but I actually want to look at the uh... great. <laughs> See, uh, it's so, all fitting at least. It's, it's all making sense. It's truly the message I'm hearing. <laughs> well, I want to get to these entomb records because I'm look I'm looking at all the ones that you were on. Mm-hmm. What was what were some of the favorites? I guess what, what were the standout ones? I gotta ones? say though, hold on a second. What? No, because we got to reflect on this. Here are two nerds in Ohio. Yeah. That love your stuff, and then it's just like, oh, you were in that band? I, I love that record. I had no idea you were on it. And there's like, a lot of that with him. Is that bittersweet, though? That's like, here you are. You got this cool opportunity. You're playing with your friends in Candlemass. Like, holy shit. And then it's just this dipshit. Like, I don't, I don't know. know. If it wasn't yeah. Grave, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, or does it not matter? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> Fine enough. I had to put it. This, well, I mean, <laughs> I knew he was in tune, but I, I I didn't know like how many records he was on, right. or whatever. But yeah. But anyway, <laughs> looking back at the entomb side of things, I mean, you were you were with him quite a while, right? So what, what, were, what were some of the more fun moments? And I guess during that time, did things get challenging? Obviously, you know, uh, people maybe have come and gone and, and whatnot. But uh, you'd mentioned Grave, you'd been with for ten years, and you weren't really meshing with the guys' personalities anymore. How how did that? How did that work with Entombed? Was it really refreshing to be with this new group of guys? And, like, I guess where did that start getting tumultuous maybe where you're like, all right, well, I, I'm kind of done with this now. And then, again, going back to the highlights too. So I threw a lot at you, but, you know, I'd like to hear some of that. Mm-hmm. Well, I was – when I when I first – I knew I – knew, uh, I know the guys from a while back anyway. Yeah. So we were – I knew I was getting along with them, but uh, uh, we and we always had a good time when we met and hang out. So that was not so hard to for that decision. But it was also very musically. It was for me refreshing and challenging to yeah. play with them. So I never played with anybody else than Ola and Jens, so right? For my entire life, you know. And yeah. And it was so. It was really. It was really nice to you know to get to know to play with other people, and I learned a lot. And it was, uh, you know, challenging and fun. And the first album we did was to ride shoot straight, and mm-hmm. it was when I re- joined the band. They almost they had almost written the whole album already. Okay. But it was not until two years later we got to record it. So. Wow. We. Uh, we did a few tours before the album, and we played a few songs. But it was uh, it was always good fun. We had lots of good times, and when they then when that album was released, it was received very very well from press in Europe, 
basically mostly in Europe. Yeah. Uh, it took a while for it to get released in America. It took almost a year, I think. Yeah. So, but we did a lot of great tours in Europe, supporting, uh, you know, Machine Head in Europe and uh, Typo Negative, and did headline tours and we played with Neurosis and yeah, did fantastic tours. Yeah, big stuff. Yeah. That year, but it was a long, it was a long year or two, you know. Right. When you're, when you're enjoying all the parties and <laughs> you know out there in Europe playing. Yeah. So. Uh, but it was definitely fun. Then, uh, then Nicky decided to leave, and it was a bit turbulent in the band, of course, because we he was the main songwriter. We didn't right. really know what direction to take, really. So. We took the decision to keep the band going, and uh, I guess we did our best to come up with stuff that wasn't that was new, but not uh, too far away from the To Ride album, which right. ended up with the same difference. I think a lot of people did not like that album at all. Yeah, see, I like that. One. Oh, I like both, but. But I could see why. I mean, I get why people did, like yeah. like the well, it was guys, you know? different. Yeah, well, did we, I... were, we worked we worked with an American producer for the first time. Oh. We didn't work with Thomas on that record. <clears throat> an outside producer. It was first time without Thomas too. So yeah, right. And that was the first record with Peter then on drums too. Yeah, yeah. Did, Cause he had Peter, come from... joined in, uh, Peter joined in on tour on the tour middle of. I think he did. The first tour was on a machine and tour he did. Yeah. Okay, because he was in Face Down before that. Because I followed mm -hmm. all that stuff. And Merciless. Mer oh, yeah. And Merciless. That's right. Yeah, crazy. Well, it was So that I, I kind of never really knew that was the first album without Nikkei. So is, has that hence the title? Like, well, there's no Nikkei, so it's the same difference. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I don't, I don't remember how we... <laughs> Came up with the title. Really. <laughs> what, what about the cover though? Is, like, is that a note to Alice in Chains? The dog? Yeah. We put all, we also put the dog on the cover. Yeah. We do, I yeah. Why we did it? <laughs> okay. It was, <laughs> it was different. Yeah, we were thinking Alice in Chains. I was thinking it was the Alice in Chains yeah. uh, ripoff album because that would make sense yeah. too. As an unknowing, which clearly we've established, this, these yeah. these idiots are sitting there listening <laughs> to this stuff. So like Grave had the Alice in Chains cover. Um, now I have no idea about the whole entombed <laughs> thing, but you know what I mean? Like, so I don't know. You, you're definitely leaving sprinkles of Alice in Chains in your, uh, your trail, whether you want to or not. <laughs> and it's not even you doing it, apparently. And remember that Alice in Chains had a vocal line saying, we, we were born into the grave. Ah, right? see, but that, we'll just say that they really like Th grave. Some say we're born into the grave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does sound... Wild, if, I don't remember what Alice in Chains yeah, that would have been, is. but I know what you're talking about. But yeah. that's on the, I think, uh, I think it's on uh, them bones on the Dark uh, album. That's the, that's the only one. There I you go. It. There's the grave. There's the grave cover. Were you? Was that? What is that? Do, you don't talk. No, no. That you're not on that, right? Yeah. yeah, that's the song. Yeah, no, I'm not. Right. That. Okay. They, I think they covered it, right? Yeah. 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 I, I was. Yeah. Them bones. Yeah. So, what, what, what was your reception of that cover? <laughs> I didn't hear it. I have heard it only once, but I, th I thought it was pretty good. Right on. Yeah, I was because it, it, it's like something that when you hear about it, like ooh, but then it's like something you can kind of really chunk up too with, with, yeah. with metal, you know, and make it even heavier. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. So Alice in Chains, grunge, all this stuff. It's, it's all tying all, in, man. It's all Somehow, tied in. yep. You're, yeah. It's all weaving. It's web. Yeah. It's grave web. Now that we'll... no, I love the Alice in Chains too, so I'm not, I don't mind really. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I dig a lot of that. I like Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, the heavier, the heavier grunge stuff. I earlier, early Nirvana's cool, uh, like Bleach maybe, you know. But uh, you know, they were the ones that were really difficult for me to listen to. But Sonic Youth and <laughs> I had friends into Mud Honey and uh, uh, obviously Melvins, you know, where it's some a band I still really dig, you yeah. know. So. Yeah, it's interesting because I would be, you know, talking about you reception and stuff and people you know or whatever the heck. Like I'm just going by my own reception. Like you know, I'm a little bit younger than you, yeah. definitely younger than you, uh, you know, Jorgen, and then the people that we know. That when it's like you like grunge, like I was like a kid, so I'm like I hate this shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I did at the time. <laughs> and then, but for it'd be sure. funny because it'd be like you know, if you're 
put me on the spot well, like what would be good you know i'd tell you something like grave was and it's, here yeah. they are they're fucking fans of it that would be like <laughs> oh, my heart would probably stop well because you got you know you're like this young american kid they're just playing and then a lot of these bands did get awful <laughs> yeah you know you tell me something about nirvana and then they're like well it's one of those bands that have three albums or something it's like all right well by the time that it was the one that i heard i did not like it <laughs> yeah so Dude, like, i hated nirvana when i was when i was young i hated it i kind of don't like it still yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll i will accept that bands i liked liked them but I, I don't. Um, but that led. So the. So are we anywhere near Death Breath in our chronology? Our chronology here. Oh, I can't remember. Well, we, where are we? I don't know. We're kind of jumping in the, all in over. The, in yeah. the meantime, with a with a with, with, entombed and um, and Crooks was a do, going on at the same time. Yeah. Right. Yep. And the Project H too. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, also you're a busy man. Around us. Huh? You're a busy man. Yeah. Did you I, have, did I you have a family it. by this time, or is this pre-family? This is uh, pre-family. Yeah, I would think so. That's a <laughs> lot of bands, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still young and uh, restless. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, able to... Well, then, I'll just fast forward to it because I was excited to talk about yeah. it because, uh, I mean, I absolutely love the Death Breath Stinking Up the Night album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, LP would be easier to hold. <laughs> Where, um, so like, and then yeah, just some of the, just I guess just, I don't know, because there's a not like an interesting dynamic of guest musician or vocals rather on the album that when yours kick in, like yeah, yours is the most intense uh, in, in the metal realm <laughs> of it. Well, I mean, I'm not to say anything, you know, despite yeah, yeah, all the other ones, sure. I love them. Uh, or, but even like Scott Carlson, who could be more deathish in his own like yeah. he's kind of got more of what everybody else is doing and then it's i don't know i guess it's more that i like i say in tomb tone and what those bands were doing where then here come here you come in there and it's just more brutal yeah uh so like what do you, were you thinking though when you got approached to a, be doing a song called flabby little things from beyond like did you <laughs> i mean it's kind of silly right <laughs> Yeah, but I was I was not surprised either. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, uh, is like, is there a like a, a well? There, I know there's like a humor to the uh, to the project, right? Or but is there like just one to the personnel, like Nick A? Like I I I've, I don't really know him, so like, is there like a humor yeah, that's there's, also there's always humor. Yeah, in the death metal, either you <laughs> like it or not. Right. Ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. But it's, if you look back to it, it's it's all about the horror flicks. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Yeah, I I figured it's probably like critters or something, but like it's just funny because it's like here I am describing the more intense vocals, I guess, and then, then they give it, maybe that's part of the humor that he gives it to you then because it is it's funny to hear like just you know flabby like flabby is just not a <laughs> it's just not it's the not word, a metal word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so to hear you of all guys doing it it's. I guess that might be the humor that, yeah, that it's like, right. man, if you're we, like, you know, we can't have, you know, Robert do it, uh, you know, Scott, no, we'll save that for <laughs> your, because it's just going to oh, you know, <laughs> flabby because it is. And it's totally the approach of it. So did you, did you embrace that humor then? And like, did it make you want to like, I don't know, perform it any differently because of that or not really? <laughs> I mean, it, it is, uh, when they asked, when Nicky called me and asked me if I could come and do some a few songs, because he he already had his vision, he wanted someone else, some little bit more like old death kind of. Yeah. Oh, uh, like, and we listen to old death metal and autopsy and everything. It's it's a whole bunch of humor into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, if you got that kind of humor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not all about you know. It's not all serious. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so now look, but like looking back at that album, like, do you actually know, do you know, like what, ha like, is there going to be, because I know they were doing more stuff. So like, were you a, because like, actually there's even a Death Breath recording um, my space that was on my space. That's what it was. It's on the Death Breath MySpace page at the time. And so I've heard it. Hell, I even played on my other podcast. That, uh, so like, it, it, it were, is there more and then are you involved with it 
No, but I, I'm not involved. I, never, I was never in the band. Yeah. Like in the band, I was yeah. uh, asked to do a few songs. And we did, at the time I was in a band called Vicious Art as well. This is after I after I quit Entombed. Okay. Uh, Death Breath. And I was in a band called Vicious Art and we did uh, maybe a couple of shows in Sweden uh, together with Death Breath. So we did. So I could uh, do some double duties on vocals there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I was never in the band, and I know they have a whole album written, but not recorded. Okay. And it's been uh, lying around for a long time. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like a, a Nicky thing. Like it seems like he's just yeah, but ripping off. You never know, because uh, one one <laughs> oh, really? day he would just take that decision. Okay, now it's the time. Right. And he, you know, but as he has his. You know, he has a lot of, a lot of shit uh, going on. Other projects. Yeah. You know, Imperial State and Lucifer, Lucifer and, and yeah. Yeah, I, when so we haven't, I guess, got your rock and roll album yet, <laughs> or or have we? And I just don't know. No, not really, right? Well, the closest is maybe to ride album. Then. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I I I haven't played on any rock and roll albums is that something that you would bark up that same tree because it seems like i don't know it's just a lot of the you know swedish death metal scene has definitely gone that route even like fred Espy more recently yeah was, i forgot what the name of that project was mm -hmm. but no no rock no rock and roll with your name on it uh, well if somebody th asks me i might do it but yeah. it's, nothing is, it's not in my plans no, no. <laughs> But I always li liked, you know, the, since you know the old '70s kind of rock and stuff. I grew up on that. So. Right, right. Well, we're failing to bring up. I mean, he's been in fucking every band that you can imagine. So, uh, one that I wanted to bring up because I loved the band, and uh, I want to say they were mostly Swedish based, but they had a UK singer. Misery Loves Company. That first record uh, was a giant poster on my wall when I was 13 years old or so. Um, but did you just fill in? Uh, for them, for shows or anything, or were you on a, one of the records? No, I'm not on the records. Uh, okay. They did a new record now after like a 16 year yeah. break or so, yeah. <laughs> and they decided to get back uh, around 2016. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we toured together, uh, when they were Misery and then Tomb and right. Machine Head in Europe. Uh, so they they called and asked if I could step in and playing bass on the on the festivals they had that year. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, when when they said it was going to do a reunion, nice. and I, I had nothing else to do, so yeah, <laughs> I did it. And uh, so they still ask me to play <laughs> whenever it comes gig, but they keep asking me to play. So. Yeah, well, that's cool. I'm, I'm really happy to do it because I really love the band. Yeah, me too. And the band members are fantastic and we always have a good time time and yeah it's uh, you know when when i'm on stage with them it's a, it's like you step into another uh, like a, know, another it's, role uh, it's out it's, yeah it's, it's step into another world kind of yeah you know? it's yeah. not uh, death metal but it's still uh, really heavy and uh, i really like it I do too, especially the first record, and then, uh, I mean, the the EP after that, and uh, some of the other stuff I was into too. But uh, the first one was was uh, the really really special one because they they were doing the industrial metal thing, but they were just way heavier than anyone else doing it at that mm -hmm. at that at that time. So it really appealed to me being into all the the heavier music. Um, yeah, it was just so intense uh, for what it was, and then even. Um, uh, got I gotta like sing it in my head. Um, the the last one they did before they they split forever. Um, something to share. Your vision. Yeah, your vision. Yeah, your vision was never not mine to mine share. To share. That album's fantastic yeah. as well. Very different, obviously, yeah. as they grew. But uh, that's one of my favorites too. So it's the first and the last, I guess. Uh, and I I haven't really listened to enough of the new new stuff, but I gotta I gotta check it out. The new one is more like a. Uh, continuance from from the last one. Okay, you should really check it out. It's really really good. Yeah, I will. I, it's funny because I've been talking to the guys online a little bit. I've been helping like share stuff and push stuff, and 
Um, mm-hmm. I listened to a couple singles, but I need to actually get the get the vinyl and get the record and and support them yeah. a little better. So I got to do that. But I guess back to you. So you got torture division we haven't talked about. I mean, <laughs> I was just that's fresh, a long standing. I was just freshening it up here oh, thanks to the internet, and then I'm like, oh, we would be here all day. <laughs> but we got to talk about Murder Squad because Murder Squad is one of those uh, lesser known Swedish bands. Total autopsy worship might have even been the whole idea for that in the first place. But I fucking love it, and probably out of all the Swedish bands doing death metal that wasn't like melodic, uh, might be some of my favorite shit ever. Uh, yeah, because I love Mine autopsy too. so much. Yeah, I mean, even yeah. both of them. I, I love both of them. Uh, maybe the first one slightly better, but uh, both are fantastic. And it, it's yeah, I don't think you said you mentioned maybe no, not hearing I'm, it. Yeah, but I'm learning. Um, yeah. yeah, some of my favorite shit, man. It's so good, so goddamn good. <laughs> As you say, it's totally autopsy worship. Yeah, complete. You know? And he, I was never in the band. I played a few live shows with them because Rick, Richard moved to America. Right? Richard Cabeza. He lives in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, when he was in the, he was he's in Murder Squad, but I filled yeah. in for him, you know, on a couple of shows. That's awesome. But it's fantastic. It's with so a, good. With a bunch of records, those two are. Oh. And they, uh, and one, and that. Uh, for the second album, they flew uh, Chris Reifert in, right? Yeah, yeah. To do vocals. Mm-hmm. His vocals and, are uh, probably my favorite in all death metal. It's just so fucking yeah, me bizarre, too. man, you know? <laughs> yeah, mine too. He's, he's the best. Yeah, he's the best. He's got the death metal yeah. spirit, as we say here. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> it, was, it was like the highlight of my vocal career being when we did the backing vocals together on that Murder Squad album. Oh, nice. That's <laughs> in awesome. the same microphones with the, <laughs> with the headphones at the same time and just <sighs> <laughs> hopefully someone got some video or pictures for you yeah that's awesome there's pictures there's pictures i had a few, i have a few pictures oh nice you have to share them with us later that's awesome <laughs> so having this big body you know of work and stuff and being largely you know their craft to where we can be fans and not have to, uh, you know, go through hearing it a zillion times, producing it, or whatever could be the thing that gets you more on a, you know, you, you, you get worn out on certain yeah, things. Right. So with that said, where are you as, like, a fan overall? Do you still collect and love death metal band and follow, like, the death metal scene and stuff? Or uh. I wouldn't say I follow it like I did used to, but I still run into bands that are new bands that I like. And, you know, I still listen to what I used to listen to. Yeah, you know, right. Autopsy, and Morbid Angel, and Death, and <laughs> you know, shit like that. Repulsion. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I follow whenever you know. It'll, at the same time, whenever any of the old bands release something, I try to have a listen to it. Yeah. You know, Napalm and. Carcass. Is there any new stuff that has sparked your interest, whether death metal or not? I mean, anything that you, you're really into or, or band I was just that you've been really say, uh, I was going to with? say thrash. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Since there's so much thrash in the beginning. True. <laughs> but we, I, yeah, we, I don't know if you have heard our new band, Cardinal Maniac. Oh. We're talking about thr- That's yeah. a new band we have, too. Yeah, well, I've been trying that's to keep a, up with all your that's shit. That's old school thrash metal. Yeah. Awesome. Like in eight or so <laughs> yeah you just really you just released a new single i think yeah yeah and uh there's uh, just two songs out on spotify and uh, we have i think we recorded six songs oh okay cool and then uh i don't even know if i say it right but dalma uh yeah yeah that's i really was i thought i think i told you uh, uh talking on the internet there but uh that's one that's a project i actually really really enjoy and that's with kent again yeah you okay so what, what? I guess what's the inspiration then for these? Because uh, well, I, you know what? I know there's a lot going on here, and he's probably got to get about his evening and whatever. But, but uh, torture division, I guess maybe give us a like. Why did that happen at the time it happened? Because obviously you did that for quite a long time, um, and then that ended, and you had some more flirtations with you know doing vocals for God Among in- Insects. And uh, if I'm wrong, maybe I don't know. Maybe that's some of the same torture division guys uh, involved. Oh yeah, well, God Among Insects was uh, Kenta and then Tobben, uh, oh, okay. who was a drummer from Vomitory. Okay. Together with uh, uh, Masse, who was in Dark Funeral. Yeah, right. Uh, Thomas from uh, Sanctification, and okay. he also plays with Hypocrisy now, I think. 
Gotcha. But uh, when they split up, Kenta and Tobin wanted to do some other stuff, and they wanted uh, called me and asked if we could do something together, and that's how we started Torture Division. Okay. So it was me, Kenta, and uh, Tob- 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 Gustafsson from uh, Vomitory. And you guys did perform live with that, correct? Oh, yeah, we did. We had a good run, actually. We did uh, three albums, kind of. Yeah. We started out like doing just uh, kind of doing demos, you know, three song demos, mm-hmm. and then released it on the internet. And then we did three more and released them on the internet, and then three more released them all for free. Yeah. And uh, then some labels asked if they could print the three first on a CD and, yeah. Do it, yeah. Whatever <laughs> you, you want, it's already. But it's always going to be free and is on the internet, and it's always going to be our songs. But yeah, if you want to print it, print it. So he printed it, and uh, then uh, we did same thing for another two albums. We just released three songs at a time. Yeah, it was a good. It was a fun idea because you know you don't. If you do three songs, you don't have to. Um, Spend a lot of, you know, the, all the songs doesn't sound the same. You know, right. for example, if you record an album, you get ten songs, ten or eleven songs, but they kind of be kind of different. Yeah, and you can get them out quicker, and like you said, keep people maybe yeah. interested. Exactly, and... it's more more like it works, kind of. And it looks like you're. Looks like... Go hmm? ahead. You're, I think you got caught up there. Go ahead. No, I see more like it, you know, people don't. People like when it happens fast too. You know, yeah, true. get the single here, get the single there, and listen to it. And they don't tend to listen to a lot of albums. So. Well, and it seems like you've continued this Wait, model. Right. right, right, totally understand. But it seems like you've continued this model with uh, your new projects, the Doma Dog and, and Cardinal. Um, yeah, it seems like you're using a similar uh, method, getting the music out there, and just uh, let people start digesting it. Oh, definitely with Dome Dog in a way, because it's not going to be in a live band. What what we know of is it's just me and Kenta doing uh, our Candlemas worship. <laughs> you know, so. I dig it. It's awesome. Yeah. So it's more Doomy stuff. Yep. It's a totally um, uh, worship of uh, Candlemas and Bolt Thrower. Yeah. Okay. It's a good combination. So there's definitely a legacy and a lot of homework on my end to catch up on. So yep. I think I'll take this opportunity then really to stop blabbing and start getting to it uh, as there's obviously a lengthy uh, conversation here already for you and a lengthy just career of work to get familiar right. with. So if this has been your first time here for Into the Darkness, then wow, it took me a really, really long time for you to get here to tell you that you can listen to the audio version of this and all the audio versions of everything, but then you can watch them and all that great stuff at ReaperMetalProductions.com. But if you're here on YouTube, well, then that's fine and dandy. You're going to be getting clips. So you go ahead and subscribe so you get all those notifications. Like, share, everything I shouldn't have to tell you because when we do all that, that means we can talk to you next time.